name is uh, Bruce Keppen. I have the privilege of being the uh, dean of the Frank H. Netter MD School of Medicine here at Quinnipiac University, and I want to welcome you to our Center for Medicine, Nursing, and Health Sciences. Uh, we are privileged today to uh, have with us uh, Frank Netter's daughter, Francine Mary Netter, uh, who just recently authored his biography. Uh, the cover of the book uh, is seen there. There are copies available out in the lobby, uh, and I know that Francine would be delighted to sign those copies. And she's going to take a few minutes uh, this afternoon and uh, tell us a little bit about her father. So please help me welcome Francine Mary Netter. You know, everybody calls him the Michelangelo of medicine, uh, the dean of medical illustration, but I called him daddy. And he had a studio in the family home. He always had a studio at home. And when I was a little girl, I used to go there quite regularly and spend time with him while he painted his beautiful pictures. And if he was painting a picture of the heart, he explained to me how it worked to circulate the blood. Or if he was painting a picture of the stomach, he explained to me about digestion. But it was really the pictures that told the whole story. So today, I'm going to show you pictures and tell you the story of Frank Netter. Frank Netter came from very humble beginnings. His parents had a stationery store in the theater district in New York. All the children had to go and work in the store before school, after school, all the children in the family. And Frankie would go there, and he would see the magazines, and he would see the newspapers. He had to deliver the newspapers. And there were pictures on the covers of these magazines and in the newspapers done by some very great artists. They didn't use photography much in those days. And he would see pictures uh, such as um, J.C. Leyendecker had the, cover, the, little, the New Year's baby every year in the de December issue of the Saturday Evening Post. Or uh, James Mon Montgomery Flagg had uh, his poster of I Want You for U.S. Army was all appearing all over town, those posters. And Norman Rockwell was just getting his start with covers on the Saturday Evening Post. So little Frankie, he would look at those pictures and he said, oh, what wonderful lives these artists must lead. I want to be an artist when I grow up. So he was always drawing pictures. And when he was 11 years old, he went and got a pencil and drew this picture of his mother. She had fallen asleep. She had been peeling potatoes and had fallen asleep. And he drew this picture of her. And he must have liked it because he kept it his whole life. And when he was in high school, he joined um, the uh, student-run publications. They had a magazine, and he would do the covers of the magazine. He would do, illustrate. Um, some of the other students would write stories, and he would illustrate their stories. And then he found out about a place called the National Academy of Design in New York. That's where they had some very, very fine artists, were the academicians. And they would teach um, art. But you. Not anybody could go and take classes there. You had to get admitted. And so Frank took his uh, portfolio, and they admitted him. And he said, oh, boy, now I have arrived. Now I will be a real artist. And he was studying art. And he learned some very fine things there that um, um, I go into quite a bit of detail about that in my book, the different types of things he learned in art. But um, his mother said, you know, Frank, art is a very nice thing but it's no way for a young man to earn a living. <laughs> you need to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer. But he struck a deal with her. He agreed to let, her, let him study art if he would go to school and keep up his studies. And that's what he did. He went to high school during the day, and he went to the National Academy at night, but only if he'd done his homework and kept up with his studies. And he did that. And then he went to College of the City of New York. He kept drawing pictures. This is a picture of the quadrangle at City College. Still looks like that, very much like that today. Then after his first year of college, his mother, she was a widow by that time, and she went into the hospital. She had a hysterectomy. 
Now, this was 1924. Anesthesia was terrible. It was a drip anesthesia. <coughs> made the patients wretch terribly. And there were no antibiotics in 1924. Well, she got an infection. And four days later, she died. And he cried, and he cried. For days, he cried. And he said, OK, that's it. I'm going to be a doctor like she had wanted. So he continued to go to college. He put himself through college. He um, painted sets. He did uh, window dressing on the Fifth Avenue, the wonderful Fifth Avenue stores in New York City, and um, sold some of his pictures to some magazines. But he was determined he was going to be a doctor, and he was going to give up art. He entered New York University Medical College in um, 1927. They gave him a box of bones. And they, you had to study if, when, in 1927. If you didn't learn, pass those tests, you were out. And, uh, but he found he could best learn his subjects by making pictures. He had been trained graphically, and it made sense to him to make pictures of the cadavers and whatever he was being taught. So uh, it wasn't long before his classmate says, could you please make me some pictures so I can learn? And the professor said, could you please make me some pictures so I can teach or to illustrate my uh, papers? And he did that. He was um, able to sell a few of his pictures that way. Uh, he made this picture. This is a view from um, New York University and from Bellevue Hospital, which is associated with New York University. And this is the East River in New York City. It looks very much like that today, even. Beautiful oil painting. Hangs in my dining room. And then he went, he interned at Bellevue Hospital, two-year internship, medicine and surgery. And Bellevue had its own ambulance, and the interns had to ride the ambulance. There were no such things as a paramedic in those days. It was the interns that rode the ambulances. And they. Um, wore those white outfits, and they had a black hat, said Surgeon Bellevue Hospital on the top. And um, they carried a notebook, a stethoscope, and a reflex hammer, and went into the tenements and, and rode in the ambulance with the driver and the, and the helper, among other things. Then after he finished his internship, he signed on to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, very, very fine hospital and teaching hospital. And he was um, in the outpatient surgery department and um, treating the patients there. It was 1933. It was the depths of the Depression. Nobody had any money to go to doctors. And if they had any money at all, they certainly wouldn't go to a young doctor right out of school. So he was moonlighting selling pictures. The pharmaceutical companies found out he could make these pictures that appealed to doctors. And he um, was selling his pictures for about $50 a picture, which is pretty good money during the Depression. But he felt very guilty about that. He thought he should be building up his surgery practice. So he um, said he's going to charge a lot of money for a picture. And then the, the, the advertising managers would go away, leave him alone, and he could devote himself to his surgery practice. So the next pharmaceutical representative that came in, the advertising manager, wanted a series of five pictures. And Frank thought, well, if I ask $300 a picture, that'll be enough money to scare him away. So he told the guy he wanted, he wanted $1,500 for these pictures. That's a lot of money, the man said. And he left. And, but the next day, he called up Frank, and he says, OK, I got approval. We will pay you $1,500 for each of the five pictures. <laughs> well, it wasn't long <laughs> before he resigned from Mount Sinai to devote himself full time to making medical pictures. In 1938, 1939, the, uh, San Francisco and environs had what was called the Golden Gate Exposition. And that was a big, um, it was like a World's Fair, and it rivaled the New York World's Fair of the, the same years. And the Sharing Corporation came to Frank and said, 
beforehand said, could you please make us an exhibit? We want to have an exhibit at the Golden Gate Exposition to showcase our work with hormones. Sharing was um, a leader in hormone preparations. And they wanted to showcase their hormones, uh, the female hormones. And um, so they thought maybe Frank could make some pictures of the hormones, the changes in the breast resulting, the hormone flows, the changes in the uterus, things like that, the baby growing. And um, Frank thought, well, that's not going to be a very interesting exhibit, just to have the pictures hanging on the wall and the writing, write up about um, what the hormones do to the body. And um, the one caveat was that it couldn't take more than 15 minutes to walk through this exhibit. So then Frank found out about a new product, brand new at the time, a product called Plexiglass. And he got the idea that he could make a sculpture of a woman out of plexiglass. And he could project in, up from underneath, project into her the uh, images of the organs and the hormone flows and the changes in the body that occur from the hormones. And he made that, and it, it was very effective. I mean, you could see a baby growing inside, and you could actually believe there was a baby growing in there. And then he had um, got a, a, a synchronized recording of a woman's voice. Now, imagine a voice very smooth, like Jacqueline Kennedy, you know, to explaining about these hormone flows and, and everything and change. This is quite shocking for 1938, you know, that a woman would be talking about such things. And so, this, the sculpture was very effective, and she went to San Francisco. She was a big hit at the Golden Gate Exposition. She had a baby every 15 minutes <laughs> and uh, for the full two years. And after that, she went to the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. That's where I saw her. And she um, had a baby there every 15 minutes to a very advanced age. But we've kind of lost track of her in the last few years. So. Also in the 1930s, um, Frank was doing work for the Seba company, Seba Pharmaceutical Company, and doing advertising work, illustrating some of the uh, advertising literature. And they got the idea that they would make a little folder, die cut in the shape of a heart, a little folder, about this big as your hand, and there would be the front of the heart on the front of the folder, and a picture, Frank's picture of the back of the heart on the back of the folder, and you open it up and there'd be two pictures, the cross section of the heart in the middle, and superimposed over the Frank's picture would be the text describing the product. It was a digitalis pro heart preparation. And um, that was very effective. They sent that to all the doctors in the land. They, they loved it. They said, they wrote in to see, but they said, we love that little folder that you sent us. Could you send us, please send me some more of those folders, but without all that writing all over it. So that's what they did. They made up little folders with the heart, and they put the writing over to the side. And that, the doctors liked that very much. And then they made up other folders of, uh, for some of the other preparations that they had to target for the stomach and the, the, the lungs and the kidney. And Frank made pictures of those organs to go with the other um, drugs that they were um, selling. And that was very effective. And so he started his relationship with Seba. This is a portrait that he did of my siblings before I was born. This is a beautiful oil painting that my brother has. Nineteen forty two is the date on that, I believe. And then in nineteen forty one, after the Germans I mean the, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in nineteen forty two, Frank Netter enlisted in the army. He knew the um, the colonel who was in charge of the Army Medical Museum in Washington DC. And uh, he was a pathologist, this colonel, and he told Frank, he said, if you will enlist in the Army, I'll get you assigned to the Army Medical Museum. It was on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. So that's what Frank did, and he went and reported to duty at the Army Medical Museum, and they had a very nice studio for him there, but they didn't have any work for him. Well, he took to reading some no mystery novels and things like that to occupy himself, and he was, felt really bad because our country was at war, you know, and he thought he'd list in the army to help the country win the war. And he, that kind of got him depressed until he got a phone call from General Weibel, General Walter Weibel, who was in charge of the training 
and the aides, the training aides, actually he was in charge of all the training for the soldiers and to train them how to take care of themselves and if they were wounded was one of the things that he was in charge of and he said we have eight hours to train these boys how to take care of their wounds or the wounds of their comrades and um, I think you have a unique talent you can help us do that so um, they wanted Frank to redo the entire first aid manual for um, the army and um, General Weibel showed him the existing manual. It was a big, thick book, and it had um, uh, six different treatments for snake bite, and it had 20 different ways to set, to splint a broken arm, none of which was available in the field. So Frank said he, could, he knew exactly what he could do. And what he did, he made a small little booklet. It was 100 pages. It was a three-by-four booklet. And, it, and on one side was a picture of the wound and how to treat it, and then just a few bullet points on the other side in words to explaining what to do for these different wounds. And that was very effective. And, and they used that in the classroom, and then the, the soldiers would carry that in their first aid kits. And um, it was very effective. It saved a lot of lives, I'm sure. He did other little booklets too. He did survival booklets, survival in the tropics, survival in the, Ar survival in the Arctic. He did a big uh, book to train um, x-ray technicians. They had to train x-ray technicians in two months, I imagine. <coughs> and he did, he did pictures for that, um, uh, how to put, place the gun and how, to, um, how far away to put the gun and things like that. And, and that worked very well, training the x-ray technicians. And then he met a young doctor in the, in the Surgeon General's office while he was in the Army. They were both in the Army together. Uh, this doctor was uh, named M Dr. Michael DeBakey, who was already advocating for uh, treating these wounded soldiers as they came home. And um, Dr. DeBakey and Frank Netter became very good friends, and they collaborated on a, um, a series of um, portfolios of about 12 or 14 pictures in a port just loose prints. Um, about eight and a half by 11 sheets of uh, the wounds that a soldier might receive and what to do, how to treat them. And the SEBA company published that, sent that out, sent those portfolios out to all the doctors in the land to how to treat the soldiers when they came home with their wounds. So that began a long friendship, a lifelong friendship, Michael DeBakey and Frank Netter. Then in 1949, the SEBA company got uh, the idea that they would um, continue with this concept of um, service to the medical profession, and they would publish a series of uh, peri a periodical, they, they created a periodical publication called the Clinical Symposia. And they would have a, an expert write the text, and the, the main feature of this clinical symposia would be the Frank Netter pictures. And that's what they did. And they had different topics of uh, interest of the times and, and, and some of the specialties. And, and these were intended for the general practitioner to find out that these things could be done. This is, uh, one of the, this is a picture from one of the early clinical symposia that Frank Netter did. And I, this is a real masterpiece. Because if you go to the art museum and you look at a lot of paintings, you see artists paint hands, and you can tell a really good artist by the hands that he can paint, and you can, you'll see the difference. And um, it's really the masters that can paint hands, and Frank Netter was a real master at painting hands. So this was a clinical symposium. It was in great demand. It was reproduced over the years many, many, many times. And then with Frank Aid, he did, uh, who was a, a psychiatrist, he did a series of psychiatric portraits. And this is a man suffering from depression, was one of the portraits in that clinical symposia. And um, I think you can see, this is not a picture of depression. This is a picture of a man suffering from depression. And there's a big difference. This is not a mannequin. This is a real person here. I've been showing you these pictures that my father painted 
uh, he painted them in the early 1950s for the uh, Armour Company. Armour wanted uh, to, to also um, give them out at, to the doctors as goodwill to promote the company. And they put, painted a series of 12 of these pictures called The Life of a Doctor. And this one is the country night call. But then, in 1953, the Seba company got the idea that they would, uh, they wanted Frank to work for them full time, and they would pay him extra not to work for anybody else. And they wanted him <coughs> to make a series of atlases of the human body in health and in disease. And they would be divided by subject matter, like it started with the um, nervous system, then the reproductive system, the endocrine system, the digestive system, and so forth. And Frank estimated that that would take him 10 years to do that. Well, 10 years came and went, and he'd hardly scratched the surface. And another 10 years came and went, and he was still working. And another 10 years he signed a contract for. He made pictures of the anatomy, such as this of the pharynx. Reminds me very much of something that Georgia O'Keeffe might have done. This is um, a schema of the liver that he did with Hans Popper, the great um, liver specialist, who was at that time at the University of Chicago, moved to Mount Sinai later. And this very, very well-known picture of a man having a heart attack, he did with um, Dr. Paul Dudley White. Here's the man after a heavy meal in the restaurant, coming up the stairs, exerting himself, going out into the cold, suddenly going into the cold, dropping his heavy valise, and dropped his cigarette. All the precipitating factors of a, health, of a heart attack are there in this picture. So how did he do it? He would make, he took this um, tracing paper, thin tracing paper, and he would make a sketch in a pencil, just a regular pencil like everybody has at home, number two pencil. And he would draw that out on the tracing paper. This little boy is supposed to be uh, poisoned. And he, he would have us, when we were kids, he would have us pose. He said, now look sick, and I'd go, oh. <laughs> Now stick out your tongue, and I'll take your picture. And he would do that. And then from the picture, sometimes he would use that, the picture. And um, so then what he would do is he'd take the sketch that he would have made, and he would ta ta tape it with masking tape to the illustration board. The illustration boards were about this big. And he would tape that to the illustration board and, and put some um, a graphite transfer paper under. and the sketch is taped down, and he would take a very hard pencil, a number six pencil, and go over the lines of the sketch. And you can see, like especially like around the mouth, you can see where he went over the sketch. That's why it looks so dark in those spots, you know, like around the ear here. It looks especially dark, maybe a little too dark for the picture. And then that would transfer very, very light lines to the illustration board. And then he would paint it, and there it is. And you can't see those pencil marks, can you? The transfer mark. He always had a special feeling for children. He felt so bad when children were sick. Or... Then in 1982, in December of 1982, Barney Clark, a dentist from Seattle, was at the Utah Medical Center, and he was dying from heart failure. And in the middle of the night, fearing that Barney Clark would not live until morning, they wheeled him into the operating room and excised his heart and replaced it with an artificial heart. It was a sensation across the country. It was in the, the newspapers across the country. And Frank Netter read about that in the newspaper. And he thought, this is a completely new modality that they have done this. This is just amazing. Then, in, that was in, on December 1st, and Barney Clark continued to live with this artificial heart, his heart excised. And 
Frank Netter was at a, a medical convention in Las Vegas, and he was on a panel, and sitting next to him was Dr. William DeVries, the surgeon who had done this artificial heart implantation on, for Barney Clark. And he was just blown away sitting next to Frank Netter because by now Frank Netter was a, a real celebrity in medicine. And Frank Netter was just interested in this artificial heart. And the two of them got to talking and Dr. DeVries invited Frank Netter to come to Utah to meet Barney Clark, and, um, which he did. He called up Steve and he said, you know, this is really an opportunity. We need to, to do this. And they would always let him do whatever he wanted because he was really their leader at this point. And um, that's what he did. He went there and he met Barney Clark. He saw and met Una Loy, Barney Clark's wife. And he was so interested to, to see those people, what wonderful people they were, he said. And he made sketches of them uh, at Barney Clark's bedside. And um, he, he just was so interested in, in how they had done this work for over 10 years developing this artificial heart. Still working on the green books, though. He was still working on the green books, still doing the clinical symposia that he just did like that one, the artificial heart. And then he was working on the really, the final um, um, volume of the green books was, uh, had three tomes to it, three, three books was one volume for that particular volume eight. And, um, but Seba got the idea, how many pictures do we have now, they said. We have over 4,000 Netter pictures. Over 40 years, he painted over 4,000 pictures for Seba. Let's do the math. That's one every three days, about. That's a lot of pictures, you know. And you think, it wasn't just the painting. I mean, he had to study. He had to learn. He couldn't make this stuff up. He had to know what he was painting. So Frank Netter, the medical educator, was probably the best medical student <laughs> to learn that, that quickly, you know. But then Siva got the idea, so they got these 4,000 pictures. Do we have enough to make a really first class anatomy atlas? So they hired um, an anatomist to go through the pictures and see what they had. And that's this gal, Sharon Colosino. And then they hired um, a book designer which was um, Phil Grushkin, this here. And um, they put together the uh, Netter's Atlas of Human Anatomy. And um, it, it really came out very beautiful. But it was quite a project to put it together. These pictures had been painted over a period of 40 years. The bone on this page had to be the same color as the bone on this, this page. The color of blood had to be the same color, on, you know, things like that. And, and it was a real project. They had to rephotograph all the pictures. They had the color separations. It was quite a, quite a project to do all that. The, public, the, the printing was um, in the 1980s, this was. And so you know, they really hadn't gone all the way to digital yet like we have today. And so it was quite a, quite a colossal project. And it, it came out very beautiful. This was, they, Frank had to do a few pictures for the, for the book. And this was the photograph they took of him and put in the frontispiece of the book. So they put it across two pages, the big in the front. And um, there he was working in his studio. But he did that all by himself, those pictures. He didn't have any helpers to help him do it. He painted all those 4,000 pictures. He studied that, all that and learned it all. So he would be very happy today to know that his Atlas of Human Anatomy is in its fifth edition. It's used in the anatomy lab here. And it's um, in probably every medical school in the, in the United States and in the world. It was in 19, when it came out in 1988, 89, it was the number one book of the year and uh, won awards for that. It's really a beautiful book. Frank Netter called it his Sistine Chapel. So, 
I'd like to, to know what he would think about all this medical school here named after him. I think he'd be just really honored. He was a very humble man. You know, he did, never went around thumping his chest. He just was trying to do a job, and, and, and this was the job that came to him. He wanted to be um, an artist, and he was an artist. When he signed on at Mount Sinai in 1933, he practiced medicine until May of 1934 when he retired to devote himself full time to making pictures. Are there any? I'll take questions now. <laughs> Yes. He was 85. In 1991, he was 85. Mm -hmm. Yes. What is your fondest memory of your father? Oh, there are so many. I mean, when I was a little girl, he would take me to the ballet at the Metropolitan Opera House to see Margot Fontaine dance. Um, we used to go horseback riding together. Um, he taught me to swim those things from when I was a little girl. And um, I used to like to go to his studio. I spent time in his studio quite a bit. And um, he would give me some art supplies to, to, you know, just go sit at that table and hear, you know. There were so many interesting things in his studio. Um, I did find one time I found uh, a notebook of his from his medical school days in the studio. I would explore the studio. Uh, when he was working, and um, I asked him about it, and he, you know, told me a little bit about that. And so, um, there's just so many wonderful memories, and, and even when we were, he was a great dancer. I loved to dance with him, you know, ballroom dancing. He was great at that. Um, I don't know how he got to be so good, <laughs> but he was great, and all the ladies liked to dance with him because he was good. Yeah. Yes. Did anybody else in your family um, have his artistic skills? Well, I guess we all used to go to the studio and stuff like that, but nobody became an artist, no. But, you know, just, I don't have a studio at home. I mean, he had a really big studio with, with the tons of art supplies. And so it was kind of, it'd be kind of, of a letdown <laughs> to try to do, to do what he did, you know. Yes. Did anyone go into uh, medicine or any of the health professions? My um, brother's daughter is a doctor in South Carolina, and um, my daughter has a master's of public health. She works at Blue Cross Blue Shield in North Carolina, and my son works at Blue Cross Blue Shield in North Carolina, and my other son um, works at Quintiles. They do clinical trials for the drug companies. That's about as close as we get to. My mother was a doctor too, actually. She, um, she was from North Carolina. She, she went to the University of North Carolina in a medical school, which at that time was a two-year school. And then she tr had to transfer elsewhere to do her clinical education. She went to New York University. She and my dad were in the same class. That's where they met. That's why I was born in New York, because she was up here. And um, when she, she finished and she interned at Bellevue Hospital as well, medicine and surgery. But when she done, was done, the jobs for women doctors were few and far between, 1933 also. And she got a job with the health department. She actually kind of made out better than some of the men doctors, I think, because she uh, would go into the schools and take care of children, and she'd go into the jails and take care of the prostitutes. So it was kind of unusual. You know, she didn't really have what we today would call, you know, she, pediatrician or obstetrician. She didn't, it was kind of a blend of what she did. And she eventually, I think she had a pediatric practice. But then she wrote a syndicated newspaper column on uh, women's health care, and that was very popular, too. Yes? 
two questions. Um, one, uh, aside from painting, did he also do sculpting? Uh, uh, you had indicated that he did some sculpture, uh, plexiglass sculpture at one point. And then the second question is, uh, did he uh, practice medicine in the sense of seeing patients at the, when he got into the business of art, or did he basically give up? He gave up, he gave up his practice to devote himself full time to making pictures. They were paying him. <laughs> so he had a, a, there was one story when he, when he had his surgery practice that he was in his, no, the, nobody was coming to him. And then finally this man came into his office and said, could you please come and see my little boy is sick. That's when doctors made house calls, of course. And um, so he went to, um, uh, to this man's uh, apartment house, a very fancy apartment, a very fancy address on Park Avenue in New York. And he went there, went to the man's apartment, and he said, could you please, 1933 now, remember, could you please turn on the lights? I would like to examine the little boy. And the man just stood there. And he asked again, could you please turn on the lights? I'm sorry, but they turned off our electricity. So he was a man, lived on Park Avenue, with a very fancy address, and he didn't have the money to pay his electric bill. So they took the little boy to the hospital and they took out his appendix, but, you know, that was 1933. I mean, this was a very grave time economically. So for him to, you know, they get, Frank Netta could not make a living as a surgeon. A lot of the doctors did, couldn't make a living. They'd go out all night, be out all night, and come home with a 50-cent piece. So. Or a chicken. Yeah, a barter, yeah. It sounds like he was a wonderful man. He was a wonderful man. He was, very, he was very, a very modest man. When my little daughter was born at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, he came to see me. And he came into my room to see the baby and me. And he was laughing. He was kind of giggling like that. And I said, why are you laughing? And he said, I was walking down the hall, and I passed some students. And they were pointing at me. And I heard them say, that's Dr. Netter. That's Dr. Netter. <laughs> and he, he just thought. He thought that was the most wonderful thing, that he had been able to help them. Not so much that he wasn't thumping his chest. It was that he was helping them, and that, that really pleased him so much that he made that contribution to help them like that, and that they recognized it, you know. So. He was a great golfer. He liked to play golf. He had, when I was going through his studio, this stuff after he died, that there were four hole-in-one trophies on his bookcase. Yeah. That's how do you have the time? Huh? How do you have the time to dance and golf and do all this, you know? He had, he had a good social life. Um, um, they would go, um, um, his wife would come, you know, Frank, it's time to change your clothes. We're going out for dinner. And she would take care of the social schedule. And, um, but he needed that, I mean, because he's alone in that studio all day long, sitting in a chair all day long. He would go out at, in the afternoon, a little before dinner, and he would either go for a swim or he would go and hit some golf balls and uh, just to loosen up a little bit, you know, you go to the drive, because you get kind of stiff sitting in a chair all day long. Yeah. So he needed that little bit of exercise. He had a um, he had an aneurysm that was very bad, abdominal aneurysm. You mentioned aneurysm. Um, my uncle was a doctor, my father's brother, and he had an aortic aneurysm, and he was supposed to be operated on here in New Haven. Uh huh. Um, that was about thirty-five years ago, and the doctors in Connecticut wouldn't touch it. So they stitched him up again. And he did some research. And as it turned out, his wife was a nurse. Um, she's from St. Rayfield's here. And um, she found out that Dr. DeBakey was the best. 
So you mentioned Dr. DeBakey, and it brought back a lot of memories. He was the one to develop that well, surgery, they, original surgery, yeah. They made arrangements to go to Texas. That's where he was at the time, and he operated on my uncle. Um, and my uncle lived another 20 years. Wow, that's great. But it was very critical. Surgery, and he's the one that did it. It's My father illustrated amazing. that surgery in one of the clinical symposiums in the, about 1955. Uh -huh. Dr. DeBakey developed that in 1953, right. and then Frank went down to Texas. And, it's right around that yeah. time. Yeah. Wow. You certainly did a wonderful job of explaining everything. Thank you. So well, this is a very high level of view. When you go into my book, it's, it's um, get down to the and learn more about Frank Netter. There's a lot more. I, just, I had a hard time putting this presentation together because I had to back up and, and just give you a very, very high level overview to fit it in a half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, these are wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a